Good evening, everyone. All right. And time for fiveable AP Euro. All right. So Miss Donovan's fourth period class ready to get fives. All right. So fourth period class ready to get fives. Jillian's here. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, we are all ready to make some vibes, right? Uh, we'll see if we got some like that. But you know, one thing that we, that I can say, excuse me, is a lot of AP testers, they don't, yeah, stay hydrated, kids. Um, take jobs. Good to see you tonight. A lot of kids taking the AP test, they don't really become aware that there's an AP test until about two days before the test. It's really funny if you look at the analytics of you know people like me who do YouTube that like my it just shoots through the roof. But y'all are here, um, you know, about good six weeks in advance. So keep up the good work and it's going to be awesome. So uh, good to see you here. And yes, make sure to sign up for that 10 week plan. And I need to start sending emails that I tell you, it's just wow, 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 wow. So busy. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to focus on our focus area tonight is going to be totalitarianism. Now, of course, as always, I can answer questions that aren't about totalitarianism if that's something that, that gets a lot of interest and that sort of thing. So be sure to let me know. And, you know, we've got some really good questions here. Emily, you never let me down. And so glad to see you here tonight. And let's go ahead and get started. OK, so can we define these terms? OK, so fascism, communism and Nazism. OK, so uh, these are all like, you know, kind of these all go under that totalitarian umbrella. All right. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure that y'all take a take a look at that. Um, that uh, Fiveable Tan has got the uh, Fiveable Plus. OK, make sure y'all are aware of that. Y'all were talking about that during the chat, too. If you want to have replays now, the replays are indexed like they've got it set up to where you can search for specific content. OK, so make sure y'all are doing that. But as far as that goes, that Fascism is an umbrella term that really sometimes gets thrown around in terms of, uh, you know, they talk about fascism. Of course, it started in Italy with Mussolini. And fascism has to do with a, you know, an approach to doing things. Of course, it comes from the Roman word, the Latin word fasces, okay, which was something, it was a symbol of the Roman state. We've actually got fas a fasces, like, you know, you see it all over government buildings, um, that it's an old Roman symbol. And really Mussolini, like that was one thing that a lot of people wanted to compare President Trump to, to Hitler. But, you know, I've seen more intelligent comparisons to Mussolini or to Andrew Jackson in the United States. But when it comes down to it, that fascism is you know, is about, uh, you know, basically a very, uh, you know, collectivist, militaristic nationalism. OK, that's what we're looking at there. And when we think about like left wing and right wing totalitarianism, left wing and right wing socialism, uh, depending on how you look at it, that typically fascism is considered uh, right wing. It's a corporatist kind of approach too. that really remember when we think about communism. OK, so if we go to the left wing of this whole totalitarianism thing and we think about communism, that it is about, you know, the state is sovereign over the individual that all of these have in common that they're not individualistic that the individual is supposed to set themselves aside uh, so that the state can can prosper whereas in a liberal uh, in a liberal society like we have in the west uh, that you know a liberal society puts the individual first and doesn't see the interest of the individual in the state as different now with communism the state owns the means of production. So all of the factories, all of the production, everything is managed by the state. And so you look at fascism, you've still got corporations like that the means of production are held in private hands. Now note that as far as that goes, uh, just Google 10 week study plan. If you want to know what that's about, that'll take you to a page on my website. Um, but if you Google 10 week study plan, you'll see it. And so with communism, the state owns the means of production, but with fascism, then you've got really, it's still in the hands of private owners. Now, the thing is that it's in the hands of private owners. So in Nazi Germany and in uh, you know, fascist Italy, you had corporations that own things, but they're expected to do what the state tells them to do. OK, so if you think about like BMW, it's like, you know, the Nazis were, were saying, OK, this is what you're going to do. This is what you know, you're going to make this and you're going to make this. And they say, OK, we're going to make this and they can keep a reasonable profit. But at the same time, the state still is in control of things. Now, there is a debate 
debate, let's remember that when we're talking about totalitarianism, uh, there is a debate about how totalitarian was fascist Italy, really, because when it comes down to it, uh, you know, Mussolini was, uh, you know, was, was there before Hitler, and Hitler took a lot of pages out of Mussolini's book, but to the point where it was truly totalitarian, where the state had, you know, established control over all of the institutions, uh, that Mussolini made a concordant with the Catholic Church, uh, known as the Lateran Treaty. And so when it comes down to it, Mussolini was, uh, you know, was the head of a nation that was heavily Catholic, and it was during Mussolini's uh, premiership that, you know, the Vatican City was created. Um, describe the echo that you're getting, Ethan, and we'll uh, see what we can do about that, uh, whether I need to put on some headphones or something like that. I'll put on headphones if I need to. Uh, let me know if it's that sort of thing or if anybody else is hearing it, and we'll see what we can do about that. Okay, so communists, okay, you believe in that the state should own the means of production, and also you have an internationalist orientation. That's the other thing about left-wing socialism, whereas when we get into the right-wing totalitarianism, right-wing socialism, uh, that we see a nationalistic element, okay? So when you look at Nazi Germany, um, okay, so as far as that... Uh, <laughs> Jacob. All right. So as far as that goes, when you look at, you know, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, you're looking at nationalism, you know, an authoritarian, militaristic, collectivist nationalism. Now, the other thing is like a lot of times people refer to like Franco in Spain as a fascist. But the thing is, that's really, uh, I mean, that's not very sophisticated. I've actually got um, an interview that I did with a college professor who's an expert in modern Spain. And we were talking about that, that when you get into like, like, uh, you know, you get into Franco in Spain, you're really looking at more of a conservative authoritarianism, whereas we would not not refer to, let's be clear about this, we would not refer to Mussolini or Hitler as total, I mean, ugh, we would refer to them as totalitarians, Hitler more than Mussolini, but we would not refer to them as conservatives, okay? That Hitler and Mussolini were not conservatives. Now, the thing is that Franco took a lot of help from Hitler and Mussolini, but at the same time, Franco was more of a conservative. Like as far as Mussolini, we don't really, or Hitler, we don't have any indication that either man professed or, you know, was serious about professing religion. Whereas somebody like Franco, Franco was a devout Catholic and really wanted to help the Catholic church, was truly concerned about the position of the Catholic church in Spain when uh, this, uh, you know, this coalition of socialists and Republicans was very anti-clerical. So remember that when we think about some of these things, we have to think in terms of, uh, you know, that these things are different. Totalitarianism, and now certainly we would never call, Fra you know, you never hear Franco uh, called the totalitarian. And Mussolini is really like, you know, when it comes down to it, the best model, when I was hanging out with Chris Freiler a couple weeks ago, you know, he was talking about how the best model for totalitarianism was Stalin, okay? Because you look at the, pro you know, the propaganda machine, um, the, you know, the police apparatus, um, the government control of all of the means of production um, and of, uh, you know, public and private life. It was done most thoroughly and effectively by Stalin. Hitler was, uh, was second, and then Mussolini is a distant third, okay? So remember that Nazism is a specific variant, like if we're thinking about like a Venn diagram or something like that, uh, Nazism is a it is a fascist, like typically it's more aligned with fascism. So fascism and Nazism, for all practical purposes in a survey level course, we can put those together. And of course, those are typically referred to as right wing, whereas, uh, you know, communism is referred to as left wing. And that's specifically because of two things. All right. First of all, state ownership of the means of production when we're talking about communism. And then second of all, the internationalist orientation. Whereas here you have private ownership of the means of production, but controlled by the state. Okay. Private ownership of the means of production, but very, very highly regulated and controlled by the state and a nationalist orientation. 
And so hopefully that's something that can kind of uh, that can kind of clear that up for you. All right. So let's go ahead. And uh, Teresa, we're going to go ahead. Let me go. Uh, I think that it's going to be good if I can get some slides out for you. Let me see what I can uh, what I can do here. And I'll actually share this with y'all in the chat. Uh, let me go ahead and get uh, let me go ahead and take care of this. Um, let's see. I want to make sure y'all have access to this as well, but I'm going to pull up my slide presentation on totalitarianism. Um, let me go ahead and get that for y'all. And got that pulled up here. And let me go ahead and share this, uh, share this with y'all. So if you want to download this, um, you can uh, you can certainly download it. That's fine with me. So I'm going to go ahead and send you all that if you want a copy of that for yourself. And let me go ahead and pull this up because we want to make sure. Yeah, we want we want to make sure that we understand the similarities and differences when we're comparing. OK, so the thing is that when we look at totalitarianism, um, it's authoritarian and dictatorial. OK, and it places the state above the individual. So remember that whether we're talking about Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, um, or the Soviet Union, we're talking about a very illiberal philosophy, okay, that we've seen over time, like this, uh, this evolution of Western governments, uh, Western politics, in the direction of liberal democracy. Now, remember, when we talk about liberal societies, we're talking about societies that place the individual above everything else. So in terms of individual rights. And so when we think about that, that's what we're looking at with totalitarianism. Now, when it comes down to it, uh, when we think about what these, you know, what these regimes have in common and why we use this label totalitarianism. Now, note some historians dispute this idea that we should uh, make this comparison. So it is, it's not without debate in the historical community. I tend to think that it fits because when it comes down to it, if you consider functionally, is it really any different to live in Nazi Germany than in the Soviet Union? Uh, you know, in some ways, perhaps. But when you start thinking about which one would you rather live in, uh, it's a tough question to answer. And so when we think about fascism and Bolshevism, now remember, fascism includes Nazism. We kind of include that in that template because Nazism is a variant of fascism. So the opposition to liberal democracy, the unity through hatred of a common an enemy. Now that is present in fascism when you think about you know the hatred of Jews and ethnic minorities and uh, you know outsiders. Whereas for the Bolsheviks, it's more class hatred and class warfare that's being encouraged there. Government by party elite. So in the case of you know, fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, uh, the Soviet Union, we look at that there is a single party running the show. OK, government by party elite, the cult of the leader. So when you think about Mussolini, Hitler and Stalin, they all cultivated a cult of the leader, that the leader is placed above everyone else and everyone looks to the leader. Like when you think about 1984, Big Brother and that. That's why we refer to, you know, or at least if you choose to use that term, that you refer to these as totalitarian regimes. And so left and right wing. Now, what we want to remember, and this is really the problem with our political discourse today, is that today in the media, like anybody who's solidly right wing is referred to as far right. OK. And the thing is that there is really a big difference between like, you know, you hear like the current president of uh, the current president of Brazil, that people will label him far right. And, and it's not this guy's not a Nazi or anything like that. This person believes in the political process. OK, so when we think about far right and far left, notice that I've got a horseshoe here because it's one of those things that these far left and far right governments have more in common with each other than not. OK, but at the same time, there are some commonalities. Like if you think about the left wing into the spectrum, the right wing, but just to be clear, that Republicans in the United States have more in common with Democrats in the United States than they have with fascists or Nazis. And Democrats in the United States have more in common with Republicans in the United States than they do with communists. 
but we can see that there are some faint echoes. There are some things that make someone right wing and left wing. Okay. And so first of all, when you think about it, that somebody who's right wing supports some degree of social hierarchy. Okay. So the thing is somebody that's right wing would, you know, believes in uh, you know, equality of opportunity, but doesn't necessarily believe in, you know, it's like social welfare programs and affirmative action and things that are, you know, that are put, put into place to try to bring about a more equal society that typically somebody who is right wing, like when we think all men are created equal, uh, you know, you're thinking that in terms of from a right wing perspective, everybody should be equal under the law. That for somebody who is right of center, there is some sort of acknowledgement that there is a natural state of inequality, okay? That inequalities are always going to exist. Whereas when you think about like democratic politicians, democratic politicians um, are more likely to talk about inequalities and how inequalities are a problem. And so when you think about that, that also applies to, you know, right wing and left wing uh, totalitarian regimes that, you know, Nazi Germany, of course, there is a social hierarchy, whereas communists deny any kind of social hierarchy that everyone needs to be treated equally, at least at least on paper. Now, we know in the Soviet Union, you know, they created this huge party bureaucracy. And so they <coughs> and so they raised their own elite. But at least on paper, everyone was equal. Now, the other thing here. And this is something that I think you can look into as well, um, is that, uh, you know, Republicans in this country, people who are more right of center, they are more comfortable with nationalism. OK, they're more comfortable with nationalism um, as a in a sense that, you know, the president, uh, President Trump said recently at a rally, uh, people are calling me a nationalist. Uh, I don't see what's wrong with that. I am a nationalist. I love this country. Uh, whereas for somebody left of center, it is more internationalist, okay? That nationalism is seen as something that is bad, that the goal here is a worldwide communist revolution. Now, later on, remember that Stalin goes for socialism in one country, okay? But Lenin, his goal, as long as Lenin was in charge, was that there needs to be a worldwide communist revolution. And so with that, when you, when you think about, uh, when you think about that sort of thing, that nationalism, now, of course, nationalism by people who are left of center, they tend to look at nationalism as inherently bad. Whereas someone right of center would say, well, nationalism may be something that could, uh, you know, be developed into something bad. Like I think that, you know, with fascism, like, you know, my perspective, and I tend to come from a little bit right of center, um, and, you know, that, that fascism, it's a particular variant of nationalism nationalism, that the problem with nationalism is when it begins to exclude people within your borders. If you can find a way to do nationalism that includes, you know, practically everyone in your country, then it's not a problem. But when nationalism gets to be a problem is when it excludes people that, you know, it's, it's defined in a way that's going to exclude people. And that's exactly what the fascists did, that they define nationalism in a way that excludes people. And so then, you know, of course, this is where we get into, like, let's not make too many comparisons between, you know, Democrats and Republicans and communists and fascists, uh, because when it comes down to it, you know, we, uh, you know, we hear these, uh, you know, we hear these you know, epithets thrown at people all the time uh, that, you know, people are racist or that people are communist or socialist. But the thing is that the way that these, uh, that these far left and far right regimes, the way they operate is fascism operates, you know, through a sort of master race ideology. Whereas for Bolshevism, there is more class hatred, okay? Which of course, if you examine American politics, you can see a few examples of that. Whereas, you know, you see people talk about, you know, racism and that sort of thing, or you hear other people talk about, well, we need to tax the rich more. But then again, remember that that's not, there's still a huge difference between somebody who is a Democrat or Republican and someone who is a, you know, is a communist or a fascist or something like that. But hopefully that helps you to make 
make sense of the situation. Um, but, you know, don't start, uh, you know, calling people, you know, socialist, fascist, that sort of thing. Um, you know, of course, there are some people today that are your age that uh, some of you students that identify themselves as socialists. I don't think they understand exactly what they're, you know, what they're identifying as. I mean, I think that they think more in terms of maybe social Democrats or something like that. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that that would be, that's really kind of the main thrust here. You want to make sure that you've got that. Now, um, Emily, this is a great question. Why were people willing to support totalitarian leaders? Now, first of all, the Russian Revolution. I mean, this is something that really was not, you know, it's not like Lenin took power through the democratic process. It's like, you know, Lenin was very organized. Lenin took advantage. Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, they took advantage of a very particular situation and you know, it was chaos. And at the end of the chaos, I mean, they, you know, they controlled everything. There was never a vote of the Russian people to become a communist, uh, a communist state. Now with, with the case of Mussolini and with Hitler, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, with Italy, there was a lot of resentment about the Versailles Treaty, and you see the same thing in Germany. Now, in Germany, it did not lead to uh, you know, a radical party taking control, but in Italy, it did fairly quickly, okay, because Mussolini was promising to restore greatness, to relieve Italy of the humiliation um, at, you know, having things promised to them and not getting those in the Treaty of Versailles. And so with that, now with Hitler, what we want to note here, and I've got a three-part video series on the rise of Hitler um, that uh, YouTube isn't doing a lot to, uh, to promote, but whatever. Um, and so with that, as far as Germany, now, of course, Germany had a hard time after World War I because of the reparations, the hyperinflation, a lot of economic uh, things going on there. But the Depression is really what kind of put that over the edge. And so why were people willing to support Hitler? And I think we've talked about this in another one, but it wouldn't hurt to, uh, to note that again. You know, why were people willing to support Hitler? And so what happened is after the, uh, you know, after we see, let's see, so the, uh, you know, German, you know, let's see, German election, 1930. Okay. So let me go, let me show you here the 1930 German federal election. Okay. So, and, and then I'll actually go before that because I want I want you to kind of get into the minds of these folks. Okay. So when we go to 1928, uh, we see that, uh, that the Nazis aren't even showing up. I mean, they're not even in the top six, okay? So what you've got here, you've got the Social Democratic Party, um, and then the second party is a nationalist party, okay? So this is the German National People's Party. Um, this is a Catholic party, the German Center Party, often called the Catholic Center Party. Um, then we've got the Communist Party with 45 seats. Uh, then we've got another, let's see, so a, lib a National Liberal Party, Party, and then a German Democratic Party. And so the thing is that this, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, you've got this large kind of coalition here and the Nazis aren't even showing up like this sixth place finisher. Um, this is 4.8% of the vote. So the National Socialist German Workers Party in 1928 only got 2.6% of the vote and 12 seats out of 491. And so when you look at it that way, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I think these, yeah, these are the Nazis here. So the Nazis are making up just a sliver. Like, you know, when you look at the, uh, you know, at the Communist Party of Germany, they're doing much better. Now, let's not forget about the communists, okay? So let's go to 1930. The intervening event is the Depression. And so now what we see here is that suddenly, like Hitler's uh, promise to, uh, you know, to make... Uh, to restore Germany's greatness, okay? To say that really, you know, remember this whole thing, we got stabbed in the back and that's why uh, that's why we're in this situation. And so what's going on here is the top vote getter was the Social Democratic Party, okay? The Social Democratic Party, which it, today is a center left party, but at that time it was kind of a democratic socialist party. And then there are the Nazis, 
uh, with 107 seats. Now, they've seen a pretty big increase in their number. Um, so you see that that's going. And so when it comes down to it, we've got the, uh, you know, the communists are, com you know, the communists are in third place. And so what happens if the communists get together with the social democrats to form a government and we've got a government where communists are participating? And so, you know, you look at these parties here where you've got the center party, the nationalist party, and then you've got the, uh, you know, the national, you know, the liberal party, and you understand why they're concerned, okay? Because a lot of times, and this is, this is very important because we don't want to, we don't want to minimize um, the evil of the Nazis and the terrible things that they did. But a lot of times we tend to forget because of the way the curriculum set up, uh, we forget the terrible things that the communist governments did as well. I mean, if we're if we were just to be able to stack the bodies um, from, you know, from the Nazis and the Holocaust and we were then to take the, you know, all of the people who've been killed by their own communist governments, uh, there's really I mean, there, there would be no comparison. I mean, it would be it would just it, that, that's the thing though that you got to think about that Hitler is an alternative to the communist. And so when we look at going to 1932, okay, that we still have this issue here where now, of course, Hitler's gotten more seats. Now he's still only got 37% of the vote, but then you look at the social Democrats and the communists who together got about 35% of the vote. And so your issue is that if you are a Catholic, uh, you know, you're a Catholic centrist or you're a nationalist, or you're, and remember, a nationalist, that does not necessarily make somebody a national socialist or a bad person or anything like that uh, to be a nationalist. Uh, you know, it's when it's combined with some other things that it starts to get toxic. Uh, you know, you hear people talk about toxic masculinity. I think you could also talk about toxic and toxic nationalism. Nationalism in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and then, so, you know, when you look at these different, uh, you know, these different parties here, that they're wondering, okay, what is it, what is our option here, okay, that do we, who's going to form a government? Do we get together with Hitler um, or do we get together with, uh, you know, or do we get together with the communists? And, and I mean, that's something that you've really got to think about here. And so what happens here? I mean, Hitler, you know, at that point never had a majority. Um, he's got 43 percent. And so the Catholics and the nationalists, they're thinking about this and they're like, you know, we're going to throw our support uh, behind uh, behind Hitler because he is promising that the communists and, you know, the communists are never going to be part of his government, uh, that he is anti-communist. And that's really what they're afraid of. OK, um, so Hitler here in Germany is the lesser of the two, uh, you know, is really the lesser of the two evils. And so, you know, very, very shortly afterwards. Now, of course, there was the Reichstag fire and that was something that um, caused, of course, they blamed that on a communist. Uh, they uh, arrested members of the Social Democratic Party and the Communist Party. Um, and I, I don't think we know exactly who did that Reichstag fire. But when you look at this, that that is a situation where people were looking at, is this the only way we can guarantee that the communists aren't going to be part of the government? That it was a very real threat, okay? That we, in the United States, we've had a couple of red scares and it's like, how how close were the communists ever to taking control of our government? Uh, not, not, not very, but in Germany, in the 1920s and 1930s, there was a very real threat of that. So that's really what's got to be appreciated. It's like, why were people willing to support, uh, you know, Hitler? And then once Hitler got in power and after the Reichstag fire decree, he started to very quickly consolidate the grip that his party had on power. And so by the time that, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was time to complain, it was too late. Hitler was already too firmly entrenched. Uh, he got dictatorial power for four years. I don't know why they did that for four years. It's kind of bizarre, but that's what they did. And by the time anybody could ask any questions, it was too late to ask any questions. But often I kind of think about in the, uh, you know, often I kind of think about in the, you know, in the context of class, I, I ask students like, you know, think about this. Would you rather live in Nazi Germany or would you rather live in the Soviet Union? Now, I typically don't 
to have a discussion about it, but I ask them to think about it for themselves. So that's just something something to consider. And so as far as that goes, certainly we can, uh, Emily. Um, can we go over the differences between Lenin and Stalin, the transfer of power from Lenin to Stalin? OK, now the transfer of power uh, specifically, that's something that I mean, I, I know Le Lenin died pretty, you know, pretty suddenly, I believe. And it's not like Lenin necessarily named an heir, so to speak. But, uh, you know, what we want to make sure we know for a survey level course, why did this matter? OK, so first of all, Lenin showed uh, a bit of flexibility in some areas. Areas, like, you know, Lenin brought about the NEP, the new economic policy. And the new economic policy was like, look, that large industries will still be controlled by the state, but small industries, what they call like petite capitalism, you know, just petty capitalism, kind of like me, like, you know, I sell like PowerPoints and stuff like that on the internet and have a YouTube channel. You know, I would be like, for the way I understand the NEP, like my operation would be flying under that radar. Okay. It's like, you know, Lenin's like, look, let's make sure that the, the state controls the heavy industry and stuff like that. And kind of let people do, you know, their own thing when they're below a certain threshold. And so then Stalin gets rid of the NEP. OK, so Stalin gets rid of the NEP and goes back to a more, uh, you know, a more controlling form of communism. Now, the other thing that I mentioned, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth mentioning again, repetition is the mother of learning, is Stalin's policy of socialism in one country that I'm no longer like he claimed because the thing is, the Soviet Union wasn't getting international recognition, and that was a problem. And you're not going to recognize a government whose policy it is that we're going to start a worldwide communist revolution, okay? That we're going to start this worldwide communist revolution. And so Stalin, you know, he said, socialism in one country. We are not trying to start revolutions in other countries. We believe that we can do this here. Now, Lenin believed that without, uh, without spreading, that communism was going to die if it was within one country. But Stalin goes with the socialism in one country. And of course, uh, you know, also, you know, Stalin had more of a, you know, more of a cult status. Like he was much more comfortable, um, you know, promoting himself as, uh, you know, as the leader, I believe, than, uh, than Lenin was. Okay, why do I think people uh, did not acknowledge? Okay, so, um, Okay, so Eric, that's uh, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting question uh, question there. Um, that I don't know, uh, you know, that's that's not going to be on the exam. Okay, that's something that I think certainly, certainly, I think, and this is where I often go back to the whole thing that there's no single cause for something. There are a variety of causes, and for different individuals, it may be different. So I think all of those are good. So, for example, like fear, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, it's just like, I mean, I ask uh, students in U.S. history, I'm like. Does anybody want to come out and say, oh, I would never own slaves? Like there's no scenario if I were born into that society and the only choice I have is to own slaves or to be dirt poor. Oh, I'd just be dirt poor because I'd never own slaves. OK, get real people. You know, it's like when we look at human nature, it's like people people are looking out for themselves. And when it comes down to it, to save your own skin, you're willing to do a lot of things uh, to people. And we're very lucky to live in a society where we're not called upon to do terrible things in order to save our own skin. And we can, uh, you know, we can accumulate uh, a comfort, you know, a comfortable amount of money without having to do anything that's against our conscience. And so fear. Now, also, we do want to mention that, uh, you know, when it came down to it, uh, you know, there are a lot of people probably thought, who cares if the Jews are being rounded up? I mean, that's probably, you know, not really something um, that that's one thing that when you think about Zionism, Theodore Herzl, the father of Zionism, um, you know, Theodore Herzl said that the Jews have tried to assimilate into Europe and they failed. That's why Theodore Herzl was saying that, uh, you know, Theodore Herzl was saying that, you know, we need a Jewish state, that there needs to be a place for the Jews to go to have their own state, because this whole idea of Jews integrating into the European community is not working. And so today, now, of course, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 90% uh, of the world's Jews lived in Europe. Europe. 
But now, uh, you know, 90 percent of the world's Jews are about evenly divided between Israel and the United States. And so the thing is that, you know, we even see today uh, anti-Semitism um, is something. Hey, Ali, how are you doing? anti-Semitism is still something that we see. I mean, when it comes down to it, that congresswoman who tweeted that our foreign policy is all about the Benjamins, it's like when you're a congresswoman, I mean, you know what you're talking about. Benjamin is a Jewish name, okay? That that's that's not like, oh, that was a complete oversight. Uh, you know, you're a congresswoman. People are watching your Twitter account and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, we see, and of course, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, right-wing anti-Semitism and there's, there's talk about which one's more dangerous, but but we definitely uh, still see anti-Semitism. And, and when you when you see how, you know, the House of Representatives has had trouble, like putting together a resolution, even that's just firmly like, look, anti-Semitism is a no, no. And so it's still something that Jews struggle with today. I mean, I don't think it's the same problem that's been, you know, that it was then, but it definitely has always been an issue. And so with that, now the other thing, you're something else I would say is ignorance in the sense that it's not like German people got to take tours of these camps, okay? This wouldn't have been the sort of thing that like, you're like, oh, I know exactly what's going on in that camp over there. It's one of those things, maybe you didn't look because you didn't want to know, but people generally didn't, I, I think the average person didn't really know what was going on. Uh, so it's not like, you know, oh, Oh, we've seen what's happening here. I don't think people can fathom if I've never if I'd never seen that stuff, I, I wouldn't even be able to think about like, you know, that that happening. I mean, it's a certain level of evil that, uh, you know, it's just mm. all right. Stalin's five-year plans, Emily. Now, that's not something we'd have to really go into. Now, that is, I think, in our um, in our course description, I think that it's something that's an illustrative example, okay? So, the five-year plans were production plans. Now, this is where we differentiate between a market economy and a command economy, you know, a, uh, you know, a capitalist economy and a communist economy. The five-year plans, like, basically, you know, Stalin, like, you know, people who who are socialists, they're, they're thinking about the economy as being driven by production, okay? So the government, uh, the government provides production, you know, pro provides the guidelines for production and everything's about production. Market economies are driven by consumption, okay? And so the thing is when there's demand for it, it will be made. But from Stalin's point of view, we need to increase production. And so it was about increasing industrial production. It's kind of like you hear stories from people who were, you know, living in Poland and other places during the Cold War that it's like, you know, you're in line for an appliance and you're going to receive an appliance like, you know, and the appliance that you're receiving may or may not be the appliance that you actually want. Uh, and then you have to go figure out how to trade with someone else because it's a production based economy. So the five year plans were about boosting industrial production. And uh, at first, uh, by my understanding, the five year plans were successful, but they became, you know, unsuccessful as they, you know, as they went on. Now, Tejas, what are we talking about the isms? Which isms are we talking about? OK. All right. So uh, so one thing that we want to uh, one thing that we want to think about here is, uh, you know, fascism. OK. What effect did it have in World War One? Didn't have an effect on World War One because it was. Remember, when we're talking about causation uh, that we are, uh, you know, we're talking about what came first. So what we want to know about fascism, fascism was a result of. World War One. Okay, fascism was a result of World War One, um, and the uh, the bitterness that a lot of people felt that you know this whole like stab the the whole stab what they call the stabbed in the back myth, uh, which. It's not, you know, I, I'm looking into this stuff. It's it's not completely without merit that there were people, uh, that there were like people who were communists, who were actively working to topple the German government. You can look at this. This is on Wikipedia. Like, I'm not talking about that I'm on some kind of like, you know, like crazy, like 
far right website uh, that there was briefly like a con like that's something that's typically not in our books, but there was a communist takeover of the German government very briefly before the establishment of the Weimar Republic, that there was an attempted communist revolution. And so after, you know, basically what happens here is after the war, uh, people, you know, there's this whole idea that, you know, Germany, you know, we didn't lose, we were stabbed in the back. And because there were some ringleaders of this communist, uh, you know, this attempted communist takeover that were Jewish, then they start to blame, you know, everybody. Now, of course, we need to also know Note, though, that when we talk about fascism, I found myself falling into the trap where I start talking about Nazism. But, uh, you know, Mussolini was not like, I mean, that wasn't really an anti-Semitic, um, you know, an anti-Semitic movement at first. Now, later on, it was in the 1930s when Mussolini did have a racial law passed that revoked the citizenship of Jews and banned them from government, uh, government employment. Now, that was really become more because of pressure from Hitler more than anything internal to Italy, okay? But in both Italy and Germany, fascism was a, uh, was a product of World War I and, of course, World War II. I mean, these are the, you know, it's like this militaristic, uh, you know, buildup. And, of course, that's, that really has a causal effect on World War II. So if you think about it, World War I was a causal, was a causal factor for fascism. Fascism is a causal factor for World War II. And sure, Emily, uh, Francisco Franco. Now, uh, the way that, you know, which I would, if you want to get, see, see that a little more, take a look at my, just look up Tom Ritchie Franco on YouTube. Um, but basically, Francisco Franco was a uh, you know, was a military officer. Uh, he was a Spanish military officer and he came from a conservative Catholic family. And the way that uh, Dr. Sanabria, uh, you know, talked about this is he talks about, you know, which we can think about in America today, that he talks about two Spains. There is the conservative Catholic Spain, and then there is the secular, more progressive Spain. And those two Spains have been at odds for a long time. And so basically what happens in the Spanish Civil War is that there is this, uh, you know, the Spanish, uh, you know, the, the Spanish Republicans who really they're called Republicans, but it, they're not like, I mean, when you start looking at some of these people, I mean, there were some pretty, uh, you know, some pretty hard left socialists that were in this coalition. And so I can see where somebody like, you know, Franco would be threatened here. OK, would be threatened, um, you know, by this sort of thing. Okay. So Franco uh, puts together, you know, he joins this Falange. Okay. Now the Falange was a, you know, was a movement that was, uh, you know, had some fascist elements, but to call it fascist, I think is going a bit too far because this is really much more, there's much more of a conservative element. Okay. Um, that is the Dr. Seuss book is the Sneetches. All right. So uh, so as far as that goes, that, you know, we would not refer to Hitler or Mussolini as conservatives, uh, but Franco was a conservative. And so his goal was to create, uh, you know, he, he ended up, you know, coming on top in the Spanish Civil War as a result, you know, partly a result of help by the, uh, you know, by the Nazis and the, uh, you know, and the Italians um, who gave him help. But of course, the Republicans were being helped by the Soviets to an extent as well. And so essentially Franco, you know, is, uh, you know, is serving is, is a dictator. And of course there were purges. Uh, there are some mass graves and there were some atrocities that were committed. Um, but Franco set up a, you know, where really for Mussolini and Hitler, the Catholic church, you know, was something that it, you had to come to an agreement with. Um, it was kind of a necessary evil for Franco. He promoted the church. Okay. That he wanted the church to be, I mean, that was, he was a, a devout Catholic. Now, the other thing is that Franco's government was marginalized for a while, that it wasn't recognized by, you know, a lot of Western powers, but the Cold War became uh, became a factor. And so basically other Western go Western governments recognized Franco's government because it was reliably anti-communist, that there was no risk of there being a communist uh, takeover there, uh, you know, while Franco was uh, was the dictator. Now, another thing, and that's, a, that's something that Enrique was getting into that I thought was interesting, is that Spain, as diplomatic recognition started coming in, then they were getting tourists. And so as far as tourists, it was like, okay, well, 
I guess we're going to have to let people wear bikinis on the beaches and stuff like that. And so Spain started to become, uh, you know, and I think that now while Franco was dictator, there was also, you know, the monarchy and all of that kind of stuff. So so really, like with Franco, it's it's when we look at that. To now, of course, there are some back and forth between historians, but I tend to side with those people who say that Franco was an authoritarian conservative while Mussolini and Hitler were, uh, you know, were fascist. Uh, that's something that I, you know, that I would go with because fascism tries to undermine all other institutions and to bring those institutions under the control of the state to the greatest extent possible, whereas Franco tried to bolster and uphold traditional institutions. So that's where you've got a distinction there, but a lot of people just kind of lazily call Franco a fascist because they don't really know anything about it. All right. Emily, in a word, I would say no. Okay. Now, as far as that goes, you know, Tito and you, Tito and Yugoslavia, um, he's somebody that was, oh, actually, let's, let's, let's be careful here because I, I do want to note a couple of things here uh, because, you know, we do need the long answer here. Okay. Because Tito was somebody who was, uh, became independent of the Soviets, like basically had an independent communist dictatorship, actually received some Marshall Plan money because he was not aligned with the Soviets. Now, we do want to note um, the Czech Spring is something that could be used as an illustrative example, uh, or the Hungarian Revolt. Like, if you think about, now, we don't need to go into knowing the leaders, da, 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 but the Hungarian Revolt, the Czech Spring, you know, some of these things where, of course, you see the development of the Brezhnev Doctrine. The Brezhnev Doctrine... <coughs> Hi, Kyler. The Brezhnev doctrine being that doctrine that says that when it looks like that there is a liberalizing movement in the Eastern Bloc, then the Soviets will be coming in to, uh, to do something about that. And so with that, now also the solidarity movement in Poland um, was actually the topic of a DBQ some years ago. So, I mean, that's something that if you're getting that far in the material, um, you know, talking about the solidarity movement, of course, also so um, the connection of Pope John Paul II, uh, who was, you know, of course, from Poland. Um, but the Solidarity Movement, this was a movement uh, because what the Soviets would do in the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc countries, is it was the appearance of workers having control. OK. Oh, glad to help. It was the appearance of workers having control, not really having control. So solidarity was about, uh, you know, like these were trade union members and they wanted the trade unions not to be under the control. OK, um, they wanted that to be, you know, as far as that, they wanted to be under the uh, under. They want, wanted to have their own control over the trade unions, whereas the Soviets had their own trade unions and trade union representatives and stuff like that. OK, so just to kind of uh, just to kind of be clear on that. OK, so Polish, Hungarian, Romanian. Yes. Yeah. So I, I would note that the Hungarian revolt, the Czech spring and, of course, the solidarity movement in Poland. Other than that, I wouldn't spend too much time on the Eastern Bloc. All right. So as far as that goes now, Emily, what we want to remember is that it wasn't just strong in anti-Semitism wasn't just strong in Vienna. It was it was also. Uh, yes, that's during the Cold War. Yeah, that's that's during the. Oh, I see what you're saying. OK, yeah. Now, I did watch this thing on Netflix. I forget this guy's name. This is a Polish name, but it's uh, you know, it was this guy that was like this Polish sculptor. You should watch it. It's like it's it's uh, it's. It's something that, uh, let's see, uh, Polish sculpt. Yeah, Zukalski. Um, there is a documentary on Netflix about this uh, Stalin Slaw Zukalski. Um, this is really interesting. Um, so, yeah, the thing is, Emily, now that I understand your question, um, yeah, during the interwar period, I would not focus on any of that. OK, now. Uh, but yeah, Zukalski, that documentary, I've just put his Wikipedia page, but there's a documentary about this guy on Netflix that'll blow your mind. I watched it during Christmas break. All right. So as far as back to anti-Semitism. All right. So Vienna, that really um, even like Kaiser Wilhelm II, um, there's something that he said. I mean, he was, you know, of course, lived in exile, I believe, in the Netherlands or Denmark after the war. And 
he blamed the Jews for it. I mean, the thing is that anti-Semitism, I mean, that goes all the way back. I mean, that goes all the way back to the triumph of, uh, you know, of Christianity, really. Uh, you know, and of course, there have always there's always been some tension there. But even, you know, when there's a problem, like you think about the Black Death, well, how did this come about? Well, the Jews must have poisoned the wells, okay? And so anti-Semitism is something that... Um, you see a good bit of, and this is something um, I, I talk about this in the first part of my lecture on the, uh, you know, on the rise of Hitler, that there was this, uh, you know, there was this Catholic social party, which was actually, it wasn't socialist. It sounds like, it sounds socialist, but let's see, let me, uh, let me pull this up here because it's been a little while since I've got, yeah, so this was the, uh, I mean, it was a hotbed, but, you know, you do have, like, in the sense that uh, this, um, and this is 19, yeah, that basically the idea that there are the Jews, that they are, you know, so this is a, this is what we're seeing over here. Now, what we have to remember, too, and what doesn't come up very often Okay, so there is, uh, you know, Carl Luger, who was the mayor of Vienna for a long time, and his party, you know, was a, you know, you did see the anti-Semitism here and there, the Jews like a snake around the state. Now, what you have to remember is that the Austrians, like we hear about the Treaty of Versailles, but there's also the Treaty of Trianon. And the Treaty of Trianon was the treaty that uh, between the Allies and Austria-Hungary. And basically, you know, you think Germany got screwed? Austria got screwed big time. I mean, when you look at what happened to Austria, um, I mean, they got completely dismantled. And so when we look at, let's see, when we're thinking, yeah, so the Treaty of the Treaty of Trianon, like, for example, look at Hungary, okay? So this was like, this is the other palace at Versailles, which was kind of Louis' more kind of casual hangout, um, as you can see there, obviously, right? Um, that when we look at what happened here, we see that Hungary was actually like, where are there are ethnic Hungarians, uh, we see that a lot of them live outside of what was created as Hungary. And it was given to, uh, you know, it was given to other, uh, you know, given to other people. And so you see Hungary, part of it's given to Austria, part of it to Yugoslavia and the Hungarians even, they lost several of their cities. And so, you know, as far as that goes, the Austrian empire was completely dismantled. And so they're having a rough time as well. This is a monument, a work of art here, a sculpture about the Treaty of Trianon. And you can see here that, uh, you know, showing the Treaty of Trianon as a guillotine, okay? It's something that came down and just dismantled um, the Austria-Hungarian Austria Empire. And so that's something that we want to think about too. I mean, we tend to, I mean, the thing is about European history is, you know, it's really kind of episodic because you can't do the whole, you know, the whole thing. So you pick things here and there, okay? And so as far as that goes, I think that, you know, they, they felt pretty screwed by the treaty as well. All right. Uh, so successful, basically unstoppable. Now, Eric, that was uh, because of largely because of Blitzkrieg, you know, this this tank warfare um, that uh, the Germans had come up with. And the other thing is, remember that World War One was supposed to be the war to end all wars. What we call Veterans Day in Europe, they call it Armistice Day. And so Armistice Day is, uh, you know, Armistice Day is this day that everybody, um, you know, it's like we celebrate the armistice and they would give speeches on armistice day about uh you know about you know you don't want the war you know it's like we've we've ended war now there's one there is a speech by the british prime minister um stanley baldwin um the bomber will always get through okay and that was that was the speech that the British Prime Minister um, he gave this uh, he gave this speech okay that uh, that the speech for Armistice Day in 1932 um, he called it a fear for the future okay and so as far as that goes that uh, you know he's talking about how um, great armaments and in, lead inevitably to war and when it comes down to it. Um, that Stanley Baldwin's starting to say, I mean, this is right before the Nazis take over. Um, I'll give you a uh, just a link to that uh, that Wikipedia over there that I'm looking at. And so as far as that goes, 
Uh, you know, he said that the time has now come to end to an end when Great Britain can proceed with unilateral disarmament. So he's starting to think that we can't, uh, you know, we're going to need to start thinking about um, what's going to come later on. OK, that when it comes down to it, that the next war is going to be devastating because of these, uh, you know, because of these bombers. And of course, that's the thing. I mean, there was some pretty heavy bombing during World War Two. Um, but this is really one of those things that Hitler was more prepared. OK, that when it comes down to it, the British were ambivalent about rearmament. Now, when Hitler took over, he starts this process of German rearmament at first in secret but then it becomes more aggressive and more open so i would say part of that excuse me it was hitler was ready for the war now then you know remember france is like oh we got the maginot line and you know hitler's like we'll just go through belgium again just like we did last time and so i think part of that is that britain and france they weren't ready for a war they were hoping that it wasn't going to happen, even as late as the Munich Agreement. You know, we have peace for our time that the British, you know, they, they were thinking this isn't going to turn into a war. Hitler was ready. OK, he was on the offensive. He was ready. So I would say that that is why. And of course, he hadn't invaded the Soviet Union yet and hadn't gotten the United, excuse me, the United States involved and get some hiccups. But that's OK. because We're almost done. Right. All right. So very quickly, um, Lenin's NEP, New Economic Policy, and I've answered that in another question, but it's good to have a short answer here. So New Economic Policy, and that is where um, Lenin ended up, uh, you know, saying that, look, we're not going to try to do full on communism. That's Lenin being pragmatic, that the state will control the major industries, but small businesses and stuff like that, it's not like the state needs to get involved in that right now. All right. And the thing is that I would say about Mussolini, uh, Mussolini is probably going to be more of an illustrative example. I mean, they need to I mean, I think I mean, it's like when I teach the class, I focus on I give the most focus to Nazi Germany. And of course, that I think that's a lot of people do. And that's probably part of the problem. Like I'm I am part of the problem. Why people think that, like, you know, Hitler's regime was the most evil regime that ever existed. Hands down. OK, that I'm thinking when I teach this class in future years, I need to devote more attention to the Soviet Union um, and especially things like, you know, the gulag archipelago i mean when you read this and you see just the atrocities uh that were committed there the work of alexander solzhenitsyn i think i've also got a day in the life of ivan denisovich uh, somewhere um but the thing is mussolini i would say that out of the soviets uh the uh you know the the nazis and the in the italian fascists i would say mussolini is the least important of those unless somebody's you know interested in that and a, you know, as far as that goes, I don't know, my students may or may not agree with you there, Jillian, but I uh, appreciate the compliment. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, remember that if you want to access not only the replays, but you also want to get into the cram sessions, there are going to be right before the exam, there are going to be some cram sessions that are only open to Fiveable Plus members. So make sure that you get on that. OK, make sure that you get on that before the price cut goes up. Because when you think about, you know, we've been talking about totalitarianism, but when you think about market economics, that Fiveable is going to charge full price when it comes time for that. OK, so if you haven't already gotten Fiveable Plus for your, by yourself or through your teacher, make sure that uh, that you're getting a hold of that because everybody's going to be wanting Fiveable Plus when it's coming right up on the exam. OK, so do keep that uh, do keep that in mind. And before I do that, Wilson's 14 points. OK, Wilson's 14 points had to do with reduction of arms, freedom of the seas, open treaty negotiations and of course a league of nations okay so those were four of the components that essentially this is about uh, getting you know having a peace without victory ending war it was incorporated into the treaty of versailles but also to article 231 was as well so remember that ladies and gentlemen and with that i think that that puts us uh, at the end of our evening and i will be back next week uh the topic that we've got next week i believe will be uh world war ii if i'm not mistaken but i'm going to go ahead and verify that now 
let's see, AP Euro. Uh, okay, appeasement. Okay, so I'm going to go into like appeasement and maybe get into World War II as well. Emily, where are y'all right now in your class? Uh, y'all let me know before I sign off. Um, where are y'all? Glad to help, Rhea, but where are y'all right now? Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, because I think I did this poll last time. Um, where are y'all right now? Okay, so interwar, World War II, or post-World War II, okay? All right, so go ahead, and if you could, um, let's go ahead and take a look here, and we will, uh, yeah, if y'all can tell me, are you on the interwar period, World War II, or are you already on post-war, okay? Um, so a lot of y'all are interwar, so I'm thinking that next time we'll, yeah, it's like we'll get, we might spend a couple of weeks on World War II. I'm not trying to get ahead of people, okay? But next time our topic is uh, appeasement, but then again, you know, we'll take uh, really questions about a variety of things, okay? So a lot of y'all here are on the interwar period. So we're going to be kind of heading into World War II next week. All right. So with that, okay, well, excellent. Well, next week we'll start talking about appeasement. And of course, uh, I can take, I think next week would be a good time for me to encourage some general questions as well, because I know we've been very focused on specific topics um, these last couple of weeks. Okay. So next week, our stated topic is appeasement, but of course we can get into some other things as well. All right. So uh, yes, it is always a pleasure, Jillian. And thank y'all. Uh, thank y'all so much. Excellent. Glad Glad to hear that. Okay. And thank you, Emily, for always helping me out here. It's always a pleasure.